have now. All right. So, uh, any questions? All right. Well, let me remind you of where we were. Um, we were, oh my God, I forgot to bring Shaw. Um, we've got this chalk that doesn't really work very well. I can try it, but I think I may have to run to the physics department office and get more chalk. Um, so, as examples of um, the, the two simplest non-trivial examples of representations of the Lorentz group are this, well, it's not that bad, I guess, d one half of uh, zero, theta lambda. And we saw that this was e to the minus i theta dot sigma over two minus lambda dot sigma over two. And then we have d zero one half of theta lambda, and this is um, e to the minus i theta dot sigma over 2 plus lambda dot sigma over 2. And in both these cases, we're representing uh, a Lorentz transformation that turns x and t into t plus lambda dot x and uh, x plus t whoops, t lambda uh, plus theta cross lambda. And uh, so that's the infinitesimal transformation. Um, and these then are the uh, infinitesimal two by two matrices. But um, we can extend we can use this for arbitrary finite theta and lambda, and this, uh, these are the correct representations. What happens is that this becomes more complicated. This becomes what is the standard, uh, just Lorentz transformation, which um, we would say uh, basically uh, x prime then say a would be L a b of theta and lambda xb is what we would say at that point. So this would be for finite, this is for infinitesimal, and this works for both. And, uh, okay. Um, now, what we had seen was, and, and by the way, this can be written as essentially e to the minus z dot sigma over 2, and um, let's see, what did I decide for that? Um, uh, e to the z star. And in both cases, um, what one has is lambda is the real part of z, and uh, theta is the imaginary part of z. Let me just make sure that, yeah, that's right. Could they name the Z star? Excuse me? Okay. No, where's that? <laughs> Sorry, no, let's take it back. That's one way of getting it short. Oh, you gave it back! <laughs> <laughs> I just need a second. All right. Um, So let's see, I think I wrote this in an unfortunate place. So let's just say, um, um, okay. and now these guys, what are they? Um, it turns out that that the, if we're talking about boosts, in other words, what is d one half zero um, that, that takes us from zero to um, alpha p hat, that is to say, 
where alpha p hat is, is p. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's the value of lambda. So this is a finite value of lambda, which is alpha p hat, and so this is e to the minus alpha p hat dot sigma over 2. So this is a pure boost, and um, what we saw was that this was um, i cosh uh, alpha over 2 minus p hat dot sigma cinch alpha over 2 and this is p0 plus m. There was a typo in the notes which is fixed in the online notes. This is p dot sigma, not p hat dot sigma, over 2m p0 plus m. So that's the 2 by 2 boost matrix that takes um, a uh, basically a um, a vector in the z direction um, and boosts it in the in the z direction. And, oh, I'm sorry, boosts it into the p direction, p hat direction. And um, so it takes a a, um, a particle at rest, I should say, and boosts it into the p hat direction, um, so that um, the 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 relationship between alpha and p zero is that cosh um, uh, alpha is p zero over m, and sinh alpha is um, length of p over m. Okay, so that's for the left-handed case. For the right-handed case, it's um, very much similar. And it's just that you flip this sign here. So D0 one half of um, 0 alpha p hat is p0 plus m plus p dot sigma over square root of 2m zero plus m. And we saw that in the case of a an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, we had d zag of zero a half of theta lambda on the identity d zero one half theta lambda. Now notice if this were or simply a rotation, if lambda was zero, this would just be one. It would be the two by two identity, because you'd have dd adjoint, and that would be dd inverse for a unitary operator, a unitary matrix. But these matrices aren't unitary when lambda is not zero. And um, so what we get here is i plus lambda dot sigma. And you notice that then if lambda is zero, you do have unitarity. And then d dagger 0, 1 half theta lambda of um, sigma d 0, 1 half theta lambda is sigma plus i of lambda plus theta cross sigma or theta wedge sigma 1. Anyway, this thing is the same as this for an infinitesimal transformation. So the point is that I sigma is a four vector, transforms as a four vector under this right-handed um, transformation. And uh, minus I sigma, or equivalently, I minus sigma is a four vector under um, D one half zero, which is uh, the, the left-handed kind. And so for this reason, we get, um, we're able to form scalars. The, one of the big tricks um, in, in um, quantum field theory is to form a scalar, a scalar that's invariant under all sorts of transformations. And um, 
in particular under tr space-time translations, but then under Lorentz transformations, and then in the case of the standard model under uh, the SU3 transformations that are local of, um, of the uh, color, group SU3 of color, and then also under SU2 cross U1, uh, SU2 acting on the left-handed fields, and then a U1, um, and uh, acting on both, and um, th those give the weak interactions, the color, the invariance on the color gives you the uh, strong interactions, and then when you bring in gravity, you want this action density to be invariant under, um, or I should say to transform properly under general coordinate transformation um, it's, it's, it's so as to make the action scale up. Um, and uh, so that's, that's one of the very basic principles of quantum field theory and it's, um, it's one of the parts of quantum field theory that's surely preserved in whatever theory whether it be string theory or something else that, um, that, that generalizes or that, that fixes quantum field theory. Um, and so the question is, how do you make an action density? And um, so what we saw last time, and I'm not going to torture you by going through it again, um, is that you can have a left-handed action density and it's I C dagger of X D zero minus del dot sigma, although I wrote it that way, but frankly, it looks a little more sensible if you write it this way, because obviously you're not differentiating the power and power matrices. And then you have C of X. So this is the left-handed uh, action density. Um, the right-handed one, and let me just make sure that I've changed the subscript. Um, yes. Yeah, I wrote it as I zeta dagger of x d0 e i, well there's an i, uh, there's a i d0, let's write it sensibly and then plus sigma dot grad zeta, okay. So the, this describes a massless left-handed field, a massless right-handed field, and um, these are two component field operators, C, so the C1, C2, because these are the Pauli matrices, of course, are two by two. This is a two by two identity, two by two identity, two by two Pauli matrices, zeta has two components. Um, Okay. Other questions? I should say there's a notation for this that's truly bewildering. It's this it was introduced by Van der Veen. I don't know how to pronounce Van der Veen in it's Dutch. Um, with dotted and undotted indices. And you notice I'm sparing you that. Well, the Lorentz group, you notice there were two different representations, Z and Z star. Right. So he used undotted indices for this one, dotted indices for that one, mm -hmm. or the reverse. I don't remember which it is. Um, and it leads to a it leads to a, a, a nice compact notation, but it's an added layer of, of, of notation that I don't think we need. And, um, but it's, there's a certain fraction of the supersymmetry community that loves that notation. And, um, all right, so let's, um, Let's look at the wave equation associated with this. It turns out 
that um, you, you can see that if, if C satisfies the wave equation that makes this zero, then the change in the action is, 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 is zero to first order. And that equation then is I D zero minus sigma dot grad uh, C of x equals zero. So this is for the left-handed, um, or the, the so it's this left-handed field, and for the right-handed field, what we have is I e zero plus sigma dot grad zeta of x a equals zero. So these are these are the two um, massless uh, field equations, two component massless field equations. Now you can see that in momentum space, the way you'd solve this is you'd have C of x equal to something like e to the i px times, uh, well, an integral of that times um, something, say, u of p dqp with an annihilation operator and then another term for creation operators. And uh, the point is that when you differentiate here, what you'd be getting is um, minus I E. Um, let me get this straight. Let, let me factor out the, the, the minus I. You get E plus P dot sigma, or I put the sigma first, sigma dot P on whatever this thing is. Um, let us say C of P equal to zero, so for the left-handed case. And now if you look at that, you can see you can multiply from the left by E minus sigma dot P. Then you have E plus sigma dot P, C of P equals zero. So I wrote this as C of P, say. And then this thing, is just e squared minus p squared c of p equals zero. And this is because sigma dot p squared is p squared. Do you want me to show you that explicitly, or is that obvious? Obvious. All right. Some people think it's obvious. Is there anybody who really wants a chocolate and would like me to do it? Can you do it? <laughs> 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 By the way, did I ever tell you about my flight from Shangri-La to Shangri-La? Did I tell you that story? No? Okay. All right, well that'll be a story time. <laughs> P squared. Well, what is this? This is sigma i pi, i going from 1 to 3 squared. So this is sigma i sigma j pi pj. And we're summing both from 0 to 3. On the other hand, these Pauli matrices satisfy the rule. Sigma i sigma j is delta ij plus um, I epsilon Ij K sigma K. Let me get straight whether there's a factor of two here. What is true is that sigma I sigma J, the commutators I epsilon Ij K sigma K. These with a two here, a two here, and a two there. So these are the commutation relations of angular momentum or the generators of SO3 or SU2. Um, and so if I multiply through by 4, you see that I missed a factor of 2 here. Is that right? Sorry, right, let's, let me get this straight. So the commutator sigma i sigma j is clearly 2i epsilon i j k sigma k, but um, So I 
I don't think I need the two, because what we get is we get sigma i, sigma j would be one sign. We subtract the thing in the other order, and that would give us the two. So this is the correct formula. All right, so we rewrite this as delta i, j plus i, epsilon i, j, k, sigma k, p i, p j. Okay? All right, now, the first term gives us pi pi, or pi squared, which is the real answer. And then we get plus i epsilon ijk pi pj sigma k. Well, epsilon ijk is anti-symmetric in i and j. pi pj is symmetric in i and j. So the thing is zero. Now, if you haven't seen this 20 times, that may be puzzling. So let me just show you what's going on here. We have i, epsilon, 1, 2, 3, p1, p2, sigma 3. But then we'll also have plus i, epsilon, 2, 1, 3, p2, p1, sigma 3. Okay. Well, these two, got, th these two factors are the same. This is minus that. So the two add to zero. So the result is that sigma dot p squared is just p squared. So over here, we have e squared minus p squared is zero. That means the thing ha is massless. So the, this, these two invariant actions lead to theories of massless particles. Is there a question somewhere? So it's not hunger or hunger for knowledge or for chocolate, or maybe both. Yes. So, what's the difference between the two representations, the, the d half zero and the d zero half? I mean, I know I see what it is mathematically. They're just. They're just. They're essentially. This is essentially the complex conjugate of that. Well, it's not but physically, quite, do they correspond with something? Because there's a minus z is replaced by z star, but it's. But physically, do they correspond to you in different? Well, uh, all right. Let's let let me let me remind you of, of of what we're talking about here with regard to how the fields transform. So we have some spare blackboard here. Why? How did we get these? Why are these things invariant? They're invariant because the fields transform a certain way under Lorentz transformations. And the certain way is that um, u of l, c of x, u inverse of l is d1 half 0 of l inverse c of lx. And on the other hand, u of l zeta of x, u inverse of l. Was there a question there? What is l? U of l here? L. Good question. Uh, uh, this is certainly worth a chocolate. Okay. L is the 4 by 4 Lorentz transformation, the standard Lorentz transformation you learn about as sophomores. Maybe freshman these days. U is a unitary operator. Just any unitary operator? No, it's a unitary operator that represents or that implements the Lorentz transformation. And under the under this Lorentz transformation, the fields transform this way. And that allows the action to be invariant, which we showed last time. It was a little tricky, so I it's 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 done clearly and correctly, I think, in the notes. But um, that doesn't mean that it's entirely simple. All right, this one, of course, is, I don't know why I bothered to look it up. It's just the same formula. So when I write LX, I mean, that the, I mean X prime, that is to say the image of the space-time point X under the Lorentz transformation. 
And notice it's kind of counterintuitive. There's an L here and an L inverse there. So these two different. This so this is so to speak. This is said to be right-handed, and this is said to be left-handed. So what's right-handed? Is it a field that's right-handed or left-handed? It's the field, and in the case in which the particle, in which the theory ha is a theory of a massless spin one half particle, these are all spin one halves, of course. If it's a massless spin one half particle, then the particles are also left-handed, and that's what I was about to get to. Because this thing is, uh, because e squared is p squared, that is to say, what is e squared? e squared is p squared plus m squared minus p squared on c, which is just m squared c, zero, so m is zero. All right, so now, why is it that this is left-handed? Well, there are various ways of looking at this, which um, what I've got here is, I think, the simplest way of doing it. Um, the spin matrix is sigma over 2, and this um, relation that we had over there, I'll just rewrite it. It's E plus sigma dot P C of P equals zero. So what this is saying is that um, is that sigma dot P C is equal to minus E C. And so now we've already seen that E is just the length of this vector P. So if we divide through by E, we have sigma dot P hat C is equal to minus C. And now if we divide by 2, we have sigma over 2 is minus a half C. And we use this, we see that j dot p hat c is minus one half c. So that means effectively that the, a unit vector in the p direction dotted into the angular momentum is negative. So that means then that it's left-handed. That is to say the particle's moving this way, but um, The spin, the spin, in other words, the spin is backwards and the momentum is this way. So J looks like that and P hat looks like that. So they're in opposite direction and the dot product is negative. It has the magnitude one half because it's a spin one half. Um, and you can see over here that for the other equation, what you do is you, again, go, you Fourier transform it. Maybe I should do this a second time. So in the right-handed case, we have pi d zero plus sigma dot grad zeta equals zero. And so this says E minus sigma dot p zeta is zero. And so then we find that E squared minus p squared multiplying from the left by E plus sigma dot p. So maybe I should do that in two steps. So E plus sigma dot P times E minus sigma dot P, zeta equals zero. But this thing is just E squared minus P squared, 
say is equal to zero, so m equals zero. But now the relation is that um, sigma dot p zeta is e zeta, and so sigma dot p hat zeta is zeta divided by two, we get a half, and so this says that the that j dot p hat zeta is one half zeta, which says that the angular momentum and the momentum are the same. And now, since I have a right hand here, I was confused doing it with the left hand. If I have a right hand here, it's moving this way, the thing is spinning in a right-handed way, like the fingers go around the thumb, and that is, um, you've got then the angular momentum is that way, the momentum is that way, it's plus, and so this is said to be right-handed. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there any questions now? Um, Um, so these were all, so, so the particles associated with these, with these fields, if the action densities are these, are massless. However, we can add mass terms. And the way we add a mass term is, and let me get this notation straight. Um, so let's see, where, well, I guess I can go over here. So this is the Majorana mass term, and it, in the notes it has, I just wrote it as simply minus m, uh, uh, Um, zeta transpose sigma 2 zeta minus and then to make it Hermitian m uh, zeta transpose sigma 2 zeta Hermitian conjugate and now in fact um, it would have been better to change this a little bit <coughs> write this as I M over 2 and then it would be plus I M over 2 zeta transpose sigma 2 zeta dagger and that would give you a um, a left-handed field of mass M and the, the field equation then would be as follows it would be I D zero minus sigma dot rad C and this would now equal minus I M sigma two zeta star. And so if we cancel these I's, it looks like this. So you see it's a peculiar equation. Where did it come from? The mass action density? And well, first of all, two? yes, great question. <clears throat> I guess you skipped one. Um, first of all, I have to show you why. Did, I didn't show you why this is invariant last time, did I? Okay. Let's see why this is invariant. That's the important thing. Um, Lorentz transformation. There wasn't more points. All right. This is sort of cute. Um, the Lorentz transformation, of course, is basically e to the z dot sigma. Okay. Uh, C. And now we're going to have e to the z dot sigma transpose C. Down. Transpose, and then we have a sigma 2. Now notice my left hand is down, so you're going to have to watch this 
carefully to see that I don't make a mistake. All right, a sign error or something. All right, now, so what is this? This is sigma transpose e to the z dot sigma transpose sigma 2 e to the z dot sigma c. All right? Now, here's the, this is actually very simple. The deal is that sigma 2 transpose is minus sigma 2. Because, so let me just remind you of what these poly matrices are because it actually depends exactly on them. Sigma 1 is 0, 1, 0. Sigma 3 is 1 minus 1, 0, 0. But sigma 2, and so consequently, sigma 1 transpose is sigma 1. Sigma 3, this is an equal sign. Sigma 3 transpose is sigma 3. But sigma 2 is minus i, i0. And sigma 2 transpose is minus sigma 2. Right. So now what's going on here? The transposition here puts a minus sign in terms of the 2 part, but leaves the 1 and 3 parts unchanged. On the other hand, when the one, the one and the three anti-commute with sigma two, and so when you move them through, you get a minus sign. Now let me explain that in a little more detail. So this, in other words, what is this thing? This thing is zeta transpose e to the z one sigma one minus z two sigma two plus z3 sigma 3 sigma 2 e to the z dot sigma c. Okay, so what we've got here is this e to the z1 sigma 1 minus z2 sigma 2 plus Z3, sigma 3 is a little more complicated than I imagined, but it's the sum of all these things. So it's that, right? All right. Let's put a sigma 2 over here. Okay, when this thing is an even power of this, the sigma 2 just comes right through. When it's an odd power, it, or to put it differently, I can, yeah, let's rewrite this as sum. Um, I can write this as sigma 2, I should have done this in detail, I, I was thinking this was automatic and um, in a sense it is, but all right, let me, let me write this thing here as sigma 2, z1 sigma 1, minus z1 sigma 1, minus z2 sigma 2 minus z3 sigma 3 sigma 2 all right now why is this correct it's that sigma 2 crossing sigma 1 flips the sign in other words In other words, sigma 2, or minus sigma 2, sigma 1, is sigma 1, sigma 2. So minus sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 2 is sigma 1, sigma 2 squared. And then over here you see, oh, it's gone. Well, 
Sigma 2 squared is 1, sigma 1 squared is 1, sigma 3 squared is 1. So this is just sigma 1. So I haven't changed anything here. And so this thing is, so I'm able to rewrite this e to the e to the z dot sigma transpose sigma 2, which is what I've written here, I can write that as e to the sigma 2 minus z dot sigma sigma 2 sigma 2 I thought this was which this thing was simpler. All right, let me just assert it as a, an actual identity that this is equal to sigma two e to the minus z dot sigma. I won't assign this as a homework problem, but I'll work it out for you. Um, so e to the z dot sigma transpose sigma 2 is sigma 2 e to the minus z dot sigma. And so over here, what if we use that, then what we get is this is zeta transpose sigma 2 e to the minus z dot sigma e to the z dot sigma zeta. And so this is zeta, uh, c transpose sigma 2 c. So the thing is invariant under Lorentz transformations. And um, in fact, you can see that the, the right-handed field is also going to be invariant. It doesn't matter whether it's left-handed or right-handed, because going from left-handed to right-handed, you just replace c by minus z star. And so this trick still works. So these, um, so you can describe, so this two component field can represent a massive particle transforming according to the one half zero representation of Lorentz group, or by adding a similar mass term, you can have a Part of a, a field that transforms according to the zero one half representation. So these are two different representations. You get two different two component field equations. Um, and these are peculiar field equations because on the left hand side you have C, on the right hand side you have C, uh, C star or C dagger. This is the adjoint. Moreover, these mass terms that we added here, you see, if you write C as annihilation operators and creation operators, you'd have something that would have two annihilation operators. So if this field were charged, this would violate charge conservation. So this only, you can only add this mass term in this way if you're representing particles that are neutral. You, it's not a question, but could you just repeat that? That? Just what you just said. Okay. I'm just trying to make it funny. Um, good question. Um, oh, good request. You see, these fields... So let me just blow this one. What is this field C of X? It's going to be some integral dQp over something an annihilation operator, a of p of a certain polarization, e to the i, px, some sort of a spinner, u of p, sigma, plus a dagger of p at sigma, e to the minus i, px, and then some, uh, it may not be the same, v of p and sigma. <coughs> so, this term in the action density would have two and I would be 
would have two annihilation operators, a square of creation operators, and then something in terms of A dagger and A. The A dagger and A is okay, but the two annihilation operators, if this C had pop, if the particle had positive charge, the two annihilation operators would lower the charge by two, and the two creation operators acting on a state would raise the charge by two. And so um, that would violate charge conservation. So this sort of a, an action density can only describe neutral fields. So, in a so when you, if you have charges, you can only have an action you can't, density. If, if you're going to have, we'll get to the charge case in a, in a second. What, and that's part of something that I need to tell you about that's also true for spin zero field, where it's much clearer. So I'm going to do all that, if possible, today. Um, but let's see, I just want to say something else. Originally, I mean, without the mass term, uh, these, the, 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 the action density here could be describing a charged field or an uncharged field, either way. Um, moreover, the particles, without the mass term, the particles are either left-handed or right-handed. That is to say, their spin is parallel or anti-parallel to the momentum. Okay? Whereas for an ordinary electron, the spin can point in any old direction. Okay. Now, you add this mass term, the field still transforms according to the one-half zero representation. The particles now have mass, they have to be neutral, and they no longer are left-handed because if, um, if the particle's moving, say, in this direction and the spin is backwards, you could move fast enough so that the particle would really be moving in that direction with the spin that way, and then it would be right-handed. So in other words, the, the right-handedness goes away when the particles are massive. Now, in the jargon, one sometimes says that the field is left-handed even if it's massive. Um, and by left-handed, then, all one means is that it transforms according to one half zero representation. But a massive particle can't be left-handed. Only massive particles can be left-handed or right-handed. All right, so we've, we've sort of done all of that. Now let's go to the case of uh, the Dirac representation of the Lorentz group. And I must say, this is something that is somewhat mystical and magical. Um, it's, it's really amazing and um, there's some mathematics here that I, I haven't seen it enough to get bored with it. Um, in fact, that's true of a lot of this group theory. I find it sort of intrinsically interesting. What one does is one takes a direct sum of these representations, one half zero, in other words, one representing J as one half sigma zero zero minus sigma. And we're going to represent k as i over 2 minus sigma 0, 0, sigma. So in other words, we're writing this thing as the 2 by 2 matrix 1 half 0 here, 0, 0, 0, 1 half, like that. So that's the Dirac representation. And the remarkable thing is that this comes out of what's called the Clifford algebra. You introduce, or Dirac introduced, four 
four by four matrices, which we call gamma. And this is gamma A, gamma B. This is the anti commentator. And remarkably enough, you can arrange them so that that is two eta alpha beta. And of course, that just means two minus one, 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 with zeros everywhere else. Right. So, so that these R's, your J and K? Give me that again. What are these R's? We, we were what? They're gamma the gamma R's. Is, oh, that's why there were R's. I thought there were R's. <laughs> R's. There's no R's. J and K. They the generators of the Lawrence group. Angular right. B. Okay. Now, this is quite remarkable here. Um, these j uh, one often introduces this notation. This is something I spared you of. Take the generators like this. Take this linear combination of generators. Both, or, or that is to say, we're going to write, for example, J12 is J3. Now, we're also going to write J0J as KJ. Then here's the remarkable thing. One can represent JAB as minus I over 4, the commutator of gamma A with gamma B. Quite remarkable. And moreover, one can verify that JAB with gamma C is minus I gamma A A to B C plus I gamma B A to A C. Well, what this is saying is that if these are the generators, this gamma transforms as a four vector. There are four gammas. They transform as a four vector. Moreover, the, well, let's see. I don't want to erase that. What's this noise? All right. The commutation relations of the Lorentz group Something else that I spared you from uh, JAB, JCD. It's rather complicated. It's A to BC, JAB. and J minus, whose commutation relations are just those of angular momentum and they commute with each other. If instead you want to mimic the commutations of the Lorentz group in their most complicated form, which is this, then it turns out that um, where is the equation? Yeah, that if you write JAB as minus I over 4, the commutator of two gamma matrices, they satisfy this relation. So in other words, the commutator of two gammas is a way of representing the generators of the Lorentz group. Now, 
The defining uh, property, though, of these gamma matrices is that their anti-commutators should be 2a to ab. But in fact, there's nothing unique about that. If you define gamma prime a as s gamma a s inverse, then you see that gamma prime a anti-commutated with gamma prime b is just, this, is just s the anti-commutator of gamma a with gamma b times s inverse. But that's just 2 uh, a to a b. And this a to a b, by the way, is of course just a number. It's multiplied by the 4 by 4 identity. So I should have said that. In other words, gamma A, gamma B is a 4 by 4 matrix. And so you get 2 A to AB times I. So I wrote it this way. That was just to indicate what eta is. It's eta that's that. So in other words, the anti-commutator of gamma 0 with gamma 1 well, that's going to be zero. The anti-commutator of gamma zero with gamma zero, well, this is two eta zero zero times the identity, and that's just minus two times the identity. All right, so it's good, I think, that I did this. Although the left arm was down, so you want to check this for sign. All right. So since this is just a to a b times the identity, we have s i s inverse. That's two a to a b times i. And so, if you make a similarity transformation with gamma matrices, you get another set of gamma matrices. So there's an infinite number of sets of gamma matrices, and the set. That's particularly convenient to give you this representation and this nice structure is, well, one choice, but probably more than one. So this is the this is the choice that's very nice in high energy physics. It's not the choice that you would use for atomic physics. In atomic physics, uh, this choice would make things more complicated. OK, and we were talking about these fields that transform according to 1 half 0 and the 0 1 half representations. We can bring them together as a 4 vector, C, Zeta. And um, this is called a Majorana spinner. Why is them called a Majorana? Well, in honor of Majorana, obviously. But um, notice that if we're talking about massive particles, then these have to be neutral fields. And so the, the Majorana spinner, if it's if the mass is not zero, it's a, it's a describing neutral part of this. All right, let me, uh, let's do story time for a couple of minutes. I'll tell you, um, a, uh, I hope this doesn't get me arrested. Well, I'm in the US, so it won't hurt. Um, after working very hard for something like 10 months in Shanghai, I decided I was going to get, uh, I was going to see China, because I took my laptop and working the whole time. But anyway, I flew from Shanghai to Shangri-La. And my, my point here was that it was getting hotter every day in Shanghai, and Shanghai is very humid. And one of the problems China has is um, it's on the east side of a continent. And when you're on the east side of a continent, you have terrible weather. Um, that's why California has lovely weather. New York has terrible weather, which is different between San Francisco and New York, uh, or between, uh, say, LA and Miami. Um, 
it's because the air goes to the east. Uh, prevailing wind is to the east. And so the air, on the, you're on the west coast of a continent, you're getting air that's just floated across the ocean. And so it's um, moderate because the ocean doesn't change much in temperature from the summer to winter. Whereas then it comes across the continent and acquires whatever the land temperature is. And if it's winter, then the east coast and New York, uh, the east coast of the US, the east coast of China, really cold. Summer picks up all the heat and humidity from all the farms, all the plants that are sweating, emitting uh, water vapor. So you get this mass of hot, humid air that hits the east coast of the continent. And um, anyway, so to escape that, I decided I'd fly to Shang Shangri-La, which is at um, 3,000 meters altitude, 3,200 meters. Well, so I got to the airport in time. I was going to fly. I had a ticket on China Eastern. I checked in. The flight was supposed to take off an hour or so, so I settled down and was noticed plane was late. Okay, so I asked various people where I could find some electricity to charge up my laptop so I could work on my book. And um, various people said, well, if you dig up that thing on the floor, you can get some electricity there. And so various people were doing that, but I couldn't work work the floor very well. And then I noticed it was a China telecom machine about the size of a large refrigerator. It was next to the wall. So I thought, hmm. Went over there, I sat down next to it, my back to the wall, and unplugged the China telecom machine, <laughs> plugged in my laptop charger, and worked away. So an hour went by, two hours went by. Um, the China Eastman brought some water, so we and water bottles working. And then it got to be like four hours late. And at that point, I started to notice that there was a woman and some other passenger, a woman who was one of the passengers and some other people who were arguing with the uh, people who, uh, the China Eastern personnel. And um, they, the argument seemed, as I was working along, the argument got more and more heated and louder, and more people uh, uh, came there. So I picked up my laptop, walked over, and I sort of figured out what was happening. And so I gave some support to the person, because I didn't speak Chinese, what I did, but I just sort of clapped for her, patted her on the back, encouraged her to <laughs> go for it, argue with them. And uh, she was trying to get them to um, put us up in a hotel and give us um, a thousand yuan as compensation because you know, the plane was, at this point, I think it was now so late that they had confessed that it wasn't coming. And um, we were going to have to get the plane the next morning. And uh, they blamed this on weather. And uh, I, anyway, so. So I cheered the woman, and then I went back to the China telecom machine, worked some more. And at this point, it got more and more raucous over there, and they called the police. And so there were now something like seven or eight Chinese policemen, obviously they were Chinese, policemen, and then a bigger crowd of passengers, and, um, uh, and then most of the passengers were just sitting as I was. And I was told later why it was that they called the police. It was that two weeks before, there was another China telecom flight where the plane was so late that, they, that the people would have to spend an, an extra day in Shanghai. And the passengers got so angry, they started throwing the furniture around. And um, so they called the police to make sure we didn't throw the furniture around. And um, so at this point, I got up and I went over there, and I, I learned that China, tele, China, China Eastern was willing to put us up in the hotel and give us 600 yuan, and the woman wanted 1,000. So I was worried that we were going to argue all night long, and so I said, all right, look, 
you want 600, she wants 800. I'm, I'm sorry, you want 600. I'm sorry. China, you want 1,000. China Eastern's willing to pay 600. Let's compromise 800. And they agree. And so um, they then pulled buses and us into Shanghai and um, spent the night and then got us up going nearly filming. And um, we uh, took us to the airport again and then flew us to Shangri La. Um, Shangri La, by the way, is a nice place to visit, but I would say don't go there directly from sea level. If you fly from Albuquerque to Shangri La, it's okay. If you're going there, however, from uh, sea level, go first to some place that's a mile high and then go to uh, Shangri La. I had um, a mild headache for about 24 hours. Um, but it's a um, it is a lovely place. Now, there isn't any real Shangri-La. Shangri-La was a mythical place in a certain novel that was very successful in England. Um, the Chinese, and, and that mythical place was probably somewhere in Tibet. Well, the Chinese government doesn't want people to visit Tibet. So, especially, I guess, especially Westerners. Um, and so, they picked a town or a city that was as close as possible to Tibet but in Yunnan province rather than Tibet. Tibet's a province of China, so it wasn't Tibet province, it was Yunnan province, maybe 20 miles from Tibet. And um, lovely place, um, people with this world. Um, it was unfortunately more expensive because it was a tourist um, destination. So, whereas you can get a good dinner in Shanghai for three or four dollars, in uh, Shangri-La, it's six or eight dollars. But uh, an eight dollar dinner in Shangri-La is still splurging, just as a four dollar dinner in Shanghai is a splurge dinner. Well, that's my level of splurging. Okay. Businessmen splurge on a different, totally different level. Um, all right, well, that's at the end of story time. I think I went a little bit too long there. Now, let me, let me get to the business of charge and um, to, to talk about this charge, I'm going to go to the case of just simple scalar fields. So suppose you have a field phi 1 of x and um, suppose it has mass m and you have another field phi 2 of x and it has mass m. Okay. So what does phi um, 1 of x look like? It's an integral dqp over the normal way of writing is 2 pi cubed, 2p0, a of p. Of course, I always forget what the sign is. It is a plus or minus. It's plus. E to the i p x plus a dagger of p equal minus i p x. Okay, that's psi 1. So let's put a 1 here and a 1 there. Notice, however, this is dqp, so p0 is determined. What is p0? is the square root of m squared plus p squared plus squared. And so this would be m1 squared. And then we have phi 2 of x integral, same thing, bqp square root 2 pi cubed 2p0 a2 of p e to the i p x plus a2 dagger p e to the minus i p x and now p0 is square root of m2 squared plus p vector squared. Well, if p1 and p2 are different, you can't combine these two guys because these phase factors are different. Because p0 is different. But if p1 and p2 are the same, so p1 and p2 are the same, m1 equals m2 equals m, then you can combine these two fields. 
And the way you combine them is very simple. You just say that phi is 1 over root 2 phi 1 of x plus i phi 2 of x. And now what does this look like? It's an integral dqp, 2 pi q, 2p0, and now we have a1 of p plus i a2 of p, e to the i px, and it's a common p0 here because the m is the same for both fields. And then you have a1 dagger of p plus i a2 dagger of p e to the minus i px. Let me do this. And of course, I forgot to divide by root 2. So let's put a root 2 here and a root 2 there. Okay, now you notice that something is a little bit kinky. This is a1 plus ia2, but this isn't the adjoint. This is not the adjoint of that because it's a plus i there. It's a plus i because we took phi1 plus i phi2. So what do we do? We say this is integral dqp. 2 pi q 2 p 0. We call this a of p e to the i p x, and we call this a conjugate dagger of p e to the minus i p x. So, so in other words, well, I hate to erase that. It's such a lovely relation. So, a conjugate is this. And so what you have then is a of p, a dagger of p prime, the commutation relation is that this is equal to delta q of p minus p prime you have a conjugate of p, a conjugate dagger of p prime, delta q, p minus p prime, but you have a and a conjugate uh, zero. So this, this is the anti-particle creation operator, the particle annihilation operator. Now, these could be uncharged fields. These could be neutral fields. You could put together two neutral fields in this way. And that, in fact, uh, is, is something you can do. Um, for example, the K mesons are described this way. K0 and K0 bar are neutral, but um, they're described with this formalism. Or, um, you, they can be charged, and then this thing annihilates, let us say, a positive particle. This thing creates a negative particle, and so the field um, lowers charge by one. But then you can make something that doesn't change the field by doing phi dagger phi. Now this lowers the charge by one, this raises it by one. And so you have something that doesn't violate charge uh, conservation. All right, that's all I went over.